Texas A&M went nine and one in 2020, a shortened pandemic season, probably one of the weirdest uh, seasons any of us has ever seen. They won the Orange Bowl and finished fourth in the final poll, their highest final ranking since 1939. Can Jimbo Fisher and the Aggies take a step forward in 2021 and maybe win the SEC West to compete for the SEC uh, title in a playoff spot? We're going to find out in today's video when I give you a preview and a game-by-game -game prediction for the 2021 Texas A&M Aggies. Let's go. Uh, good morning, that's Uncle Lou here. Yeah, that's right, it's me, Uncle Lou. Guess what? I'm live for you on YouTube today. Hey, subscribe to this channel if you're not already. Did you know I post college football videos almost every single day of the year? It's true. Some of them are even watchable. I don't know about this one. You'll have to let me know about that in the comments down below. That decision is left up to you, the viewer. Also, let me know at the end of the video if you think I got this record right or wrong. And if you think I got it wrong, let me know which games I got wrong. Tell me what you think the Aggies are going to do this year, who they're going to beat and who they're gonna lose to. All right, as usual, I've got my copious notes here. Uncle Lou does all the research, so you don't have to. That's right. Uh, I am the people's YouTuber. Uh, you have to have been around a long time to get that reference there. Anyway, like I mentioned at the top, Jimbo Fisher returns head coach Texas A&M after going nine and one in 2020. Best season Texas A&M has had probably in, in, in most of our lifetimes. Uh, like I mentioned, they finished fourth in the final poll and that was their highest ranking to end a season since 19. 39 so a really really good season for texas a&m some obvious questions heading into 2021 for texas a&m who's going to replace quarterback kellen mond he was there for what seemed like forever he started for uh three full seasons there leading them to a pretty good year last year you got to replace him in an age of college football that's being dominated by offense the quarterback position is even more important now than it's ever been before they got a couple of guys competing for that starting job that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. They've had three straight top 10 recruiting classes. So the talent is there. Regardless of what you think about Jimbo Fisher, the guy won a national title. Um, now you can say what you want about that Florida State team. I happen to think it was a great team. I wasn't a fan of some of the issues and the way they were handled at Florida State by Jimbo Fisher. But there's not very many national title winning coaches walking around. I mean, you're talking Nick Saban, uh, Dabo Swinney, Ed Orgeron, Mac Brown, who else is on the list? Jimbo Fisher. And that's about it in terms of current coaches who have won a national title. So I think you got to give the guy a little bit of credit. He's put together some amazing recruiting classes. Like I mentioned, the talent at Texas A&M is top notch, three straight top 10 recruiting classes. Got to replace the quarterback though. We'll see. Let's take a look at Texas A&M's offense and see what it might look like this coming season. Of course, Kellen Mond is, is gone. It's going to be either Haynes King or Zach Calzada. Is that his name? I, most people that I talk to say Haynes King. I tend to agree. He's a little bit more athletic than the other guy. And we know Jimbo Fisher, when he has had his most success at Florida State, it was with an athletic, uh, mobile, dual threat QB, Jameis Winston. Haynes King gives you that. Zach Calzada's got an absolute rocket for an arm. He's everything you want in terms of being able to throw the ball. We'll see. I'm leaning towards Haynes King. At the running back position, both of them come back. Isaiah Spiller, over 1,000 yards last year in only 10 games. That's pretty good. Probably going to increase those numbers this year. He splits carries with Devin Akane. Uh, Akane? Akane? Achaney? I don't name these people. He was the MVP of the Orange Bowl. So two really good running backs at Texas A&M. Wide receivers, entire wide receiver core returns. All of them. Every single one. Um, this is unbelievable. Um, Ania Smith, Caleb Chapman, I mean, they're all back. If you're looking for question marks uh, for Texas A&M this year, other than the obvious, which is the quarterback uh, position, offensive line. They lose four starters from last year's offensive line. Now, like I mentioned, they've recruited really, really well. But I say something uh, about the offensive line all the time. You can have five of the most talented offensive linemen in history. If they can't play together as a unit, they're not going to be a very good offensive line overall. I'm not suggesting that's the case at Texas A&M. What I am suggesting is there's four new starters on Texas A&M's offensive line, and it's going to take some amount of time for those players to learn to play together as a unit. How much time? That's to be determined. We don't know. Is it something they can get figured out in the uh, preseason or fall camp? Is it going to take them a game or two to sort of get used to it? Something to keep an eye on, replacing four starters along that offensive line. Defense, nine starters back on defense, and they were one of the top-ranked defenses in America last year. They led the SEC 
in defense in a lot of categories. They did give up a lot of points in a couple of games, but let's be honest, almost every team gives up a lot of points in a couple of games every single year, especially if you're playing any of these top offenses. It's hard to limit these top offenses to really anything under 30 points these days. It's an offensive game right now. Offenses have some inherent advantages right now with some of the rules and way to protect the quarterbacks and the wide receivers and the targeting rules. You add to that sort of the uh, infatuation everyone has all of a sudden with the spread offense and the RPOs and offenses that have talent and speed and skill are putting up a lot of numbers, even against good defenses. Texas A&M's defense was pretty good, and you get nine starters back. Defensive line could be even better than it was last year. You Now, you do lose maybe your best defensive line last year. He's gone off to the NFL, but you get back your defensive end, uh, DeMarvin Leal. He's really, really good. Kind of underrated, too, in my opinion. Uh, All-American potential, I think. Definitely All-SEC. Defensive tackle, Jaden Peavy, and another defensive end, uh, Michael Clemens. Those are two super seniors. Now, of course, you have a lot of players playing in college football this year that have already used up all their eligibility under normal circumstances. But because of the pandemic season last year, all college players were given one extra year of eligibility. Texas A&M's defense has taken advantage of this. They have several quote-unquote super seniors on their defense that would have been gone this year that opted to come back, resulting in the nine returning starters, two of those super seniors along the defensive front in PV and Clemens. Entire secondary returns from last season, including cornerback Miles Jones, another super senior, but he's not the best corner on the team. Uh, another Jones, Jalen Jones, only a sophomore, played last year as a true freshman, looked really, really good. Again, you're going to get burned. Corners are going to get burned. Uh, I, I can show you a hundred plays on YouTube of Deion Sanders having touchdowns scored on him. Doesn't mean he wasn't a good corner. Jalen Jones is really good. Might be the best corner. Might be the best DB on the entire team. And at safety, Damani Richardson is back. He started every single game since his freshman year when he's been healthy. He has had to miss a few games with some injuries and some health concerns, but he's got a ton of experience just like the rest of this Texas A&M defense. I'm going to be honest with you about Texas A&M. When I, uh, I, I, I sort of do all these videos where I approach all these videos the same way. I have an idea in my head when I sit down to make these videos about how good or not good I think a team will be. Questions that I have about a team, right? Some are obvious, like in the case of Texas A&M, if you know anything at all about Texas A&M, you have to be wondering about their quarterback situation. Sometimes after I sit down and do these research for the videos, I find out that I was pretty close uh, to, to what I thought before I actually looked into the team. Sometimes the team ends up being, uh, or I end up projecting the team to be worse than what I initially thought. Sometimes I end up projecting the team to be better, and in some cases, a lot better. And this video falls into one of those categories. Texas A&M, I think in 2021, is going to be better than what I initially thought they were going to be in 2021 before I sat down today and started looking into them. All right, let's put the schedule up on the screen, and I'll let you know what I think they're going to do. All right, here we go. You can see the schedule up on the screen. Now, let me address what I think has become sort of a misconception, maybe not within the SEC, but nationally when people look into the SEC. Alabama has won the SEC West twice in the last four years. Alabama's the best program in college football right now. They may be in the greatest dynasty of all time right now. If you look back over the last 12 seasons at Alabama, we may never see another 12 seasons like that. Again, not taking anything away from Alabama. However, there's kind of this perception out there that Alabama just wins the West every year, wins the SEC every single year, makes the playoffs every single year, which is not true. They missed the playoffs a couple of years ago, played in the Citrus Bowl. Alabama's really, really good. But this idea that they win the West every single year is a little overblown. Now, true, 2017, they didn't win the West, but they did win the national title, which... <laughs> They'll gladly take that over a division championship. But that's not really the point that I'm making here. The point is, I think a lot of people, when they sit down and think about the SEC, they go, well, Alabama's going to win the West, and then they just try to figure out the East. Two of the last four years, Alabama's won the West, and clearly Alabama could win the West again in 2021. But it doesn't happen all the time. Can Texas A&M win the West in 2021? Let's find out right now. Up first for Texas A&M, week one at home, they play Kent State. 
Uh, who do we know that went to Kent State? That's right, Mark Rogers. <laughs> I think Nick Saban went there too, but yeah, I think Mark Rogers went there too. So uh, Kent State, uh, you'll get a win. This will be a good game for Texas A&M to start out with this year. You know, I know fans like these big uh, opening weekend games. Georgia plays Clemson, Alabama plays Miami. If you're a Texas A&M this year, I don't care how how con if you're a fan of Texas A&M, I don't care how confident you are in Haynes King or the other guy for that matter. It sure is nice to get a chance to see them play against a team that you don't really have to worry about, right, in the first week. If Texas A&M was playing some big non-con game this week against um, Ohio State or uh, Penn State or Wisconsin or North Carolina, um, whatever, um, you'd be a lot more nervous, right, about the quarterback situation. Certain years... You're, you're almost glad you're playing a lower classification school week one. And in the case of Texas A&M, I feel like this, this year is one of those cases. If I was a Texas A&M fan, it would not bother me at all to be playing Kent State in week one. I get a chance to see what the quarterback can do without having to worry about are we going to win or lose the game. Texas A&M should win this game easily and, you know, not the best competition on the schedule, but I think we'll have a pretty good idea of what Texas A&M is working with at the quarterback position after we watch that game. Week two, another non-con game. This time you go on the road to take on Pac-12 opponent, Colorado, out west in the mountains. You'll get a win. Colorado is a bottom-of-the-barrel Pac-12 team. There's not a lot of talent on the team. They don't perform well. Their records haven't been well the last couple of years. They've replaced coaches, uh, I think, twice in the last four seasons. Not a very stable program. A step up in competition from Kent State for Texas A&M and the new starting quarterback, whoever it happens to be, but not one that I expect Texas A&M to stumble on. They're 2-0 with a win on the road at Colorado. Week three, you got another non-con game here. This one at home against New Mexico. Again, this should be an, uh, a relatively easy win. And by this point in the season, we'll have, we'll have seen Texas A&M's quarterback, whoever it is, play three games. And we'll have a pretty good idea at that point of what to expect. Week four, you have a neutral site game, your first SEC game of the year. It's going to be against Arkansas. Arkansas was a good story last year. Not that they were a good or great team, but it was a good story. They hadn't won any SEC games in a couple of years and only won one or two SEC games over the last three years. The schedules came out last year, the 10-game SEC schedules, when people just said, my God, Arkansas is going to go 0-10. They might as well just forfeit all their games. And they ended up winning three games. I'm not trying to convince anybody that Arkansas is a top 25 team this year, although I guess it's possible. But the point is, Arkansas was a good story but they should not and, in my opinion, cannot compete with a Texas A&M. I think Texas A&M beats Arkansas relatively easily. Maybe the game stays close in the first half, but I think Texas A&M pulls away with this one and gets another win. They're 4-0 and on a roll. Mississippi State, potential trip-up game here. I mean, Mike Leach is a great offensive mind. He's a complete weirdo. Uh, the guy's a maniac. Uh, but he's a pretty good offensive mind. We saw him have some pretty good wins last year and then some really bad losses as well. They were not very good overall as a team last year. They had that huge win week one against LSU that caught everybody by surprise and really did nothing much after that. Will they be any better this year? <sighs> Maybe a little bit, but again, they should not be able to compete with a team like Texas A&M. Three straight top 10 recruiting classes two great running backs, uh, wide receivers all over the place, uh, top defense in the SEC last year and returns nine starters. I'm giving uh, Texas A&M the win again at home here against Mississippi State. And then you have the week six game. And of course, this is the one that everybody is looking forward to when you look at the SEC West schedule this year. Almost 100% of the people you talk to have either Alabama or Texas A&M picked to win the West. Maybe a few uh, have LSU. Auburn, not not very high expectations this year with a brand new coaching staff. Not that they couldn't, but most people are looking at Alabama and Texas A&M in the West. This will be Texas A&M's toughest game of the year, I'm sure. Uh, they haven't beat Alabama in a while. Alabama rarely loses during the regular season. We've seen it uh, for the last 12 years, like I said. You do get Alabama at home, which is a huge plus and a huge benefit. Um, hopefully, if you're a Texas A&M fan, we're still at full capacity in terms of stadiums at this point in the season. Health and safety comes first, and I get that, and I, I, I'm not sliding that at all, but it would just be a huge advantage for Texas A&M, clearly, to have 100,000 people at this game as opposed to some kind of 30, 40, or 50,000 limit. 
uh, unless you're Florida, then it doesn't matter. Dan Mullen blamed a loss against Texas A&M last year. Said it was uh, Texas A&M's fault they lost because he had 35,000 people in the stands instead of 25,000. But anyway, Dan Mullen's a world-class clown. Uh, you don't have to worry about Nick Saban making those kinds of excuses. Um, I expect this to be a really good game. Um, clearly, I, I, question marks really for both teams at the quarterback position. I know Bryce Young was very highly recruited for Alabama, and everyone expects him to sort of come in and have a good year, myself included. Haynes King, pretty highly recruited too. I, I, I feel like people are doubting, myself included, Texas A&M more this offseason because of the quarterback situation than they are Alabama. And I get it. You know, at Alabama, there's five stars all around. Uh, Bryce Young to sort of help him pick up the slack at Texas A&M. Yeah, you got some talent. Maybe you don't have the number of five stars Alabama does. I think this will be a really good game. Texas A&M's quarterback has got to be great. Not good, not average, um, you know, not complete a high percentage of passes, but never take chances downfield. No, Texas A&M's quarterback has got to be a game-changing, playmaking QB for Texas A&M to have a chance in this game. Um, I, I don't know how confident I am that that's going to be the case. I picked you to beat Alabama, though. I, 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 Alabama will be favored. This isn't a slight on Alabama. I, I, it's not a slight against Alabama. Alabama's an amazing team every single year. But they do lose from time to time. They do get beat every once in a while. And I just have a feeling that this is the year uh, that Texas A&M catches them at home. The roster is loaded on both sides of the ball. Really, my only concern is the quarterback and how well can he play. Again, he's got to be a guy that can go out and win you a game to beat Alabama. You're not beating Alabama with a Jake Fromm, for example. Uh, you know, you can complete 80% of your passes. You can throw for 250 yards. But if you can't make a play when you need one, if your quarterback can't get you a first down on third and 12 in the fourth quarter when you absolutely have to have it, if he can't take off and run for a first down uh, at a critical point in the game, you're not going to beat Alabama. Haynes King is going to have to be able to do those things for Texas A&M, for Texas A&M to have a chance in this game. So I'm going out on a little bit of a limb here. Um, again, if all I did was pick the favorites to win every single game and just say, well, Alabama's winning the West again every year, blah, 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 there'd be no point in making these videos and it'd be boring. And if you've been watching college football for any amount of time at all, you know that this is why they play the games. You don't always get the results you're going to expect. So, again, this is not a slight against Alabama, but I've got Texas A&M winning this one at home. And, and if this was in Alabama, I would have picked Alabama for sure. But I'm going to give A&M the nod here. I think Jimbo Fisher becomes the first. Uh, was he a Nick Saban assistant? I guess he was. Uh, so maybe he becomes the first to beat Saban. I, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. We'll see. But I've got you now um, at 6-0. Now, before you cook off the video thinking, well, you, uh, you must have Texas A&M going undefeated, it's extremely hard to go undefeated. I've seen teams beat Alabama and then lose to a five- or six-win team. I've seen it. Well, you know, weird things happen in college football. Do I think Texas A&M is talented enough to go 12-0 and in the regular season? Well, yeah. Uh, there, there's five, six, seven, eight teams in every single year that are talented enough to go 12-0. and How many of them actually do it? Not very many. You're lucky if you get one or two undefeated teams at the end of most seasons. Sometimes you get three. It's very hard to play up to your potential every single week. And that's what you've got to do to go 12-0. Let's see if Texas A&M can do it. Week seven, you turn around, you go on the road, and you play at Mizzou. This is going to be a difficult game for Texas A&M. Win or lose. It comes the week after Alabama. Well, so win, whether you win or lose against Alabama. I've got you beating Alabama. Don't celebrate too long into that next week because Mizzou is going to be a sneaky good team this year. They return a lot of players from last year's team, too, and they were playing much better at the end of the season than they were at the beginning. You have to go there. It's not a place you're used to going to to play. You, uh, you, you know, what do you play there? Once every 10 years in the SEC? So not a familiar place. Now, I, I guess you did play them from back in the... Uh, uh, back in the Big 12 days, but there's nobody on Texas A&M's team now who's ever made a trip to Mizzou. This is going to be a difficult game. You could lose this game. You beat Alabama and celebrate too long, uh, you could take an L. You lose to Alabama and mope around too long the next week, you could lose on the road at Mizzou. I've got you winning, though. You're 7-0. and I do think this is a potential trap game. I like to try to find a trap game on every single schedule, right? If you're 7-0 and or 6-0 and and have beaten Alabama, Top three, probably, at that point. It'd be very easy to sleepwalk into Missouri and catch a, a beating. 
It could happen, but I've got you winning. Then you come back home and play South Carolina. You play them every year. They're your cross-division game from the East that you play every single year since joining the SEC. And they've yet to beat you. You've let yet to lose to them. I don't see it happening this year. they got a brand-new coaching staff and not very much talent. I think you beat South Carolina. You're 8-0 heading into your bye week. And uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about Texas A&M by this point in the season if this uh, ends up happening. Uh, you come out of your bye week. You play... Uh, an Auburn team, again, with a brand-new coaching staff. So two games in a row, you get a team with new coaching staff. You get Auburn at home. I think you beat them. On the road at Ole Miss, Prairie View A&M, and at LSU, this is where you lose a game and could lose two. Could lose two. You're going to beat Prairie View A&M. So we'll give you that. That's a win. Last two regular season SEC games at Ole Miss in Week 11, at LSU in Week 13, you're losing one of those games. You want to decide which one? Fine. I picked LSU. I think LSU knocks you off at the end of the season. It could be Old Miss and you beat LSU, or you could lose to both. I don't think what, – what it boils down to for me is this. I don't think Texas A&M is going 12-0. It's just extremely hard to do. But I do think they're going to beat Alabama. So then it becomes a thing where, okay, where, where's the loss then? If you don't, if I don't think they're going to go undefeated, but I think they can beat Alabama, I just think it lines up good for them this year. Where's the loss? I don't think Mississippi State, you know, at Mizzou, maybe. But at Ole Miss and at LSU, they come late in the season. I think you're going to lose one of those games. I have it being last game of the season on the road at LSU. So you beat Ole Miss in what I think will be a wild shootout type of game. You beat Prairie View A&M. You lose your last game of the season on the road at LSU. But don't worry. Uh, how many uh, losses is that? That's uh, two SEC losses? No, one. That's only one SEC loss. Chances are, if that happens, you would win the West. It would depend what LSU did. LSU has to lose two regular season games in this scenario, uh, SEC games in this scenario, and uh, you would be in the uh, SEC title game. I haven't done an LSU prediction video yet, so you'll have to uh, catch that when it comes out to see what I think LSU is going to do this year. Uh, but what the hell? Uh, so, well, spoiler alert, uh, LSU isn't going 11-1 or 12-0, and so you will win the SEC West. I've got Texas A&M winning the SEC West in 2021. First time winning the division since joining the SEC about 10 years ago. Knocking off Alabama, losing one game late in the season, finishing 11-1, and and making a trip to Atlanta the first Saturday in December to take on Whoever wins, well, let's just be real. You're going to be playing Georgia. Good luck with that. Anyway, uh, shout out to all the Texas A&M fans who might be watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Share this video somewhere uh, if you don't mind. If you don't mind, and I'll see y'all. Have a good morning.